Hi, good morning. It is Thursday. It's a tad bit past 9.30. Uh, so guess what time it is? We're talking about the plant of the week. Uh, I'm really super duper excited and I say that every single time and I swear to you I really am. Uh, we are talking about the Disneyland Rose today. Um, the Disneyland Rose is very near and dear to my heart because I am a really big Disney fan. Um, I have been a big Disney fan ever since I was a kid. I grew up here in Southern California going to Disneyland. Uh, it's something I do all the time uh, and it's really exciting that we actually have the Disneyland Rose. Um, it is exclusive here to Rogers Gardens which is really exciting. Um, if you didn't know, we have a really interesting connection here at Rogers with Disneyland. Um, if you notice on our name tags and all over our kind of logo is a little gazebo and that gazebo is actually here um, on our property up at the restaurant and that is the original bandstand from Disneyland from Main Street. Uh, when you first go into Disneyland. We actually have that here. Uh, so it's really amazing because you can actually go up to the restaurant and eat in that gazebo. Uh, it was originally painted white. They've stripped that off and the wood underneath is so beautiful. It's really, really amazing to see that in person. It is, it's just the most beautiful, well-made gazebo that you've ever seen in your life. It's just got all this really intricate design all over it. It's really kind of cool to go in there and actually be able to sit in there and know that that is the original one from Disneyland. Uh, we have replicas of the gazebos all over here at Rogers. Um, and I have this really beautiful behind me that we got here for spring opening. Uh, this gorgeous metal one uh, that we have back here, but that's kind of become our iconic trademark here at Rogers. Uh, so that connection with Disney with us is huge. Uh, so this is the actual Disneyland Rose. So if you know someone who is a Disney buff and they're not even maybe a garden person, they probably want this. <laughs> um, and if you're a garden person, this is a really fantastic rose. Uh, they were looking for a really long time, uh, the horticulturalist at, uh, sorry, at Disney looking for a rose to be their trademark rose. Uh, if you've gone in there anytime recently, uh, you'll notice that the rose that goes up the arches um, where the monorail is, is a really beautiful kind of orangey color. Uh, that one's been there for as long as I can remember. So it's kind of amazing that they found a shrub that actually kind of matches with that. So when you go into the parks, the ones that are planted that are shrub one, those are the Disneyland roses, not the climbing ones. I think a lot of people who ask me about it get a little confused by that because they are very similar colors, but that is not it. Uh, this one is the one, it's the little shrub one. This is all over inside California Adventure too. If you ever go over into that other side there, they have it planted everywhere. What's really amazing about this, they were looking and looking for a trademark rose and they wanted something that was gonna be kind of compact. They wanted something with really amazing color and they wanted something to be really disease resistant. So this rose has all those qualities. When you're dealing with so much landscape like they do there at Disneyland, they want something that's gonna be easy but be a really good performer and they found it, which is really fantastic. So, and the color on this is really, really neat. I pulled a couple of different ones. Uh, so you can kind of see what the variation of color is, but it's this beautiful orange apricot color. So when it first uh, buds out, it's got this really beautiful kind of orange, almost a little hint of like a fuchsia -y red color. Um, and as it opens, so this is an open one. This one is pretty bloomed out, but it lightens up significantly. So uh, it gets that really kind of beautiful light apricot color. So it's a range of colors. It's really kind of nice because you can match it up with almost any garden, which is really fantastic. Um, you can see on the little tags here that we have the coloration on there too. So you can see what that looks like. Um, and we have beautiful posters and stuff of it everywhere. But what's really great about this is it really blends well with other roses. So I think a really well planned out rose garden, you're gonna have variations of colors, but they're all gonna match each other just a little bit. Um, so then that way there is kind of a cohesiveness going on. So I think that's really, really important. And what I really appreciate about this one, and I have this one planted at home, is it's a little bit shorter and a little bit shrubbier. So with some of my taller long roses that I have, it works really well underneath them. So that's really important when you're planning out something like that, is know what the colors are, know how they go together, and know how big they're gonna get. So then that way, you don't have a bunch of tall ones on one side and a bunch of short ones on the other side of your garden, that you're kind of alternating those two. So I really, really like that this actually does that. And some of the things that I think it goes really well with, I brought a couple of them to show you, um, is State of Grace and Frida Car Car Carlo. 
I always say that wrong. I always add an R to it. Uh, this is State of Grace, and the coloration with it is so pretty. State of Grace is a taller rose, so I have mine next to my State of Grace, so that way I've got that height there, um, and then I have the low here, and then um, in between that I have, so it goes Lady of Shalott, which is an orange color, then this one, then the State of Grace, so that way I've got that variation of sizes. Um, I don't have any of the Lady of Shalott yet. Uh, that is a David Austin. We will be getting David Austins and we just haven't got them in yet. Uh, they're always a little late to the party. <laughs> they like to make a grand entrance, that David Austin. Um, but this is the Frida. Isn't this beautiful? So this colors, these colors together are just so perfect. So like I said, a well planned rose garden, there is some continuity to it. And even if you go from like a red all the way to purples, having that kind of variation and color and having them match each other instead of just one of this, one of this, one of this, and it looks a little bit chaotic and that's fine too. Uh, but a really good planned out garden, you have something that matches together and you're really thinking about the size. So when you're buying this one, know that it's a nice little small compact one, uh, very, very disease resistant. Uh, this is my uh, second year having this. Yeah, this is my second year. Um, and it's a really, really good performer. It's already flowering for me. It's pretty amazing. Uh, so I cut it back in July and it looks, you know, it's a little shrubby kind of little guy. So it is a little, when you're pruning back a shrub rose, you have to kind of work on it a little bit because it's not just a bunch of canes like a, a hybrid tea or a tea rose would be. Uh, you are looking at that kind of shrubbiness and trying to keep that shrubbiness because that's what makes it so cute. And what makes it so cute is it works well in pots too. Because it's small and compact and shrubby, this is a fantastic one for pots. So even if you're like, oh, that's great, but I don't have a garden that I can really plant this in, works well in containers too, uh, which is fantastic. The other thing that I really like about this one is that we're selling them in peat pots. So we're really trying to get away from the plastics here at Rogers and there are a lot of plastics and we're, we're a garden center where we really focus on um, the environment and making sure that um, everybody's really well educated on how to have a beautiful garden but also really care about the environment as well. We are 100% organic here. We've been 100% organic for many years, over 10 years now. Uh, so everything that we sell from the fertilizers to the sprays, all organic, which is really great. Um, but a lot of plastics come with a lot of our plants, right? So we actually have a recycling program here called Plants Not Plastics. So you can bring your one gallon and above containers back. Uh, and for those, we actually donate to the Surfrider Foundation. But we're trying to find ways here to get away from plastics altogether so that that way we're not dealing with all these plastics all the time because eventually they break down and we have to throw them away. After they reuse those pots so many times, they're not going to be reusable indefinitely. So we're trying to find a way around that. So we have these peat pots. So these pots are actually made out of paper. Uh, they are something you can still reuse. They're great, great, great for peppers. So I reuse all these pots for growing peppers in. You do not plant them in these peat pots. I think a lot of people get a little confused with peat pots and they think, oh, I just plant the whole entire thing and drop it into the ground. You still want to take it out of this. Uh, they're not going to uh, decompose in the ground quickly enough so the roots can actually break through. It takes a very long time. So do not plant them in these peat pots. Take them out of it, plant it the way you would a regular rose, um, and then reuse this peat pot. And I can reuse a peat pot probably for about three years. Uh, and I, I grow um, my small micro little tomatoes in there. So those little micro minis uh, that are super cute that we got in this year grow really well in these. And peppers too do great in them. Uh, so it's a great thing to reuse and you get a good couple of years out of it even. Um, and then when you're done, you can just throw it into your compost bin and all is good. And you don't have to worry about all those extra plastics uh, that we're creating and we're trying to get away from that. Uh, so then that way, you know, on top of making our gardens beautiful, we're making the world beautiful as well. So it's kind of an amazing thing that we're doing here that I'm really, really proud of. It makes me really happy to work for a company that really is concerned about those kind of things, uh, truly. So it's, uh, it's a great thing, but such a beautiful, beautiful rose. Doesn't require a lot of extra care. Doesn't require a lot of extra pruning. Deadheading is always good on any plant. So when the rose is done, and I would say this one is about done, um, what you want to do is you want to clip that away. So I'm going to grab my pruners and just do a quick little demo for you. So you just find the rose uh, that you want to cut off. You trace it down to the stem. And of course, that's right where the tag is. Let's take this tag off. I didn't even think about that. So taking that tag off um, and you're tracing it down and you're just going to clip it right at the base. Ta-da! 
super easy. And the reason that we're doing this is this rose is spent and we want it to put the energy into not making rose hips, but actually making more roses. Uh, so keeping them clipped also keeps them pretty, keeps the petals off the ground. So a lot less work for you, but uh, such a great color. I love it so much. And it's perfect because this is my color palette for my roses because these are the roses that I had already. And when it came in, I was like, please, 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 please be a good color that I could actually use. And look at that. It's perfect color that I can actually use, which is really cool. Uh, so when it comes to fertilizing um, and keeping your plants happy and making sure that they're really vigorous and growing really well, full sun. So you want at least six hours or more of sun. Uh, they like to be warm. Uh, they like the full sun. That's going to make them flower a lot more. If you try to plant these and not enough sun, they're going to get stretchy and they're not going to flower very well. The flowers will be floppy uh, and they're not going to be as big. So full sun. That's why it's great if you don't have full sun, but you have a pot works really well in a pot. Uh, fertilizer, my tried and true down to earth. Uh, this is a granular, just throw it on the ground. Super duper easy. Uh, I use about a fourth a cup per rose and I do it uh, every month. So I always do it at the first of the month. So I don't forget uh, when you're first planting it, you want to put some of this in the hole as well. Uh, that works really well or something even with a little added uh, mycorrhizae will really help it get established and grow deeper and bigger. Um, and then I love, love the compost tea. The compost tea, this is what really encourages all that good mycorrhizal growth. Uh, you throw this in a, a bucket of water, you let it soak overnight, and you use that water to water it in. So usually what I do when I'm going to use this is I uh, start it before the first of the month, I let it sit overnight, I put my fertilizer down, I pour all that water from the bucket into uh, my watering can, and I use that water to kind of stir in all of the powdered fertilizer that I put on the ground. So this is tremendous. This stuff is fantastic. Once you start using it, you won't stop. They gave me a free bag when I first started working here and now I'm totally hooked. That's how they do it, right? So that's how they get you. Um, and then as for sprays, the only problem I've ever really had on this is an occasional aphid. Um, I've never had any mildew problems. I've never had any black spot or rust problems. Um, which is pretty good because I'm really coastal and there's a lot of marine layer where I live. So it truly is very, very disease resistant. Sometimes I'll get the occasional aphid um, on some of the new growth because they really like that nice little new growth. Uh, so I always make sure that I put some worm castings down that really helps fight the aphids off. It almost is like a natural systemic. The plant takes up an enzyme uh, into the plant that the aphids, the mealy bugs, the white flies don't like it. They don't like the taste of it. So that works really well. But if I do get one, sometimes just a good squirt with water helps. Um, they're so soft body. You don't have to worry about if you squirt them that you're spreading it around. People get a little concerned about that that's not a problem they're so soft bodied and so delicate if you squirt them hard with water it's going to probably kill them if your infestation is really bad that's when you're going to pull out this guy every rose gardener should have this in their arsenal this is fantastic this has sulfur in it and it has insecticidal soap in it so the sulfur works for all of the powdery mildew problems the rust problems the black spot problems uh, but the insecticidal soap works on all those soft bodied insects so if you have this you're gonna be able to spray almost every problem that you'll ever have on your rose with this and it will help so uh, those couple of things keep them really good but in general they're very easy so if you're nervous about roses and you're like oh I'm not really a gardener this is a great starter rose because it's super super easy uh, it doesn't get out of control it's really really shapely the whole year round uh, it's not something where I have a couple of roses my Lady of Shallots, one of them where by the end of the season, I'm like, okay, monster, you've gotten gargantuan and I'm cutting you back constantly. And it gets just a little bit too big uh, and kind of drives me a little bit crazy. So this one doesn't, it just sits there and goes, look at me, I'm perfect year round, which is pretty amazing. So um, of course we are live. So if you have any questions about this, uh, you can always put those questions down below and we'll answer some of those questions for you live. Uh, if we go over a little bit, make sure you keep putting your questions down there and we'll answer them for you as well. I'll put a list of all the different fertilizers and things that I recommended here. Uh, so those will be posted. So look back on those too. And if you've got a Disney friend, call them right now and let them know that we have the Disney roses. So uh, it is something that will sell out and run out. So uh, it's really, really great. I bought one for me. I bought one for my mom. Uh, it's just a great thing to have uh, if you're a Disney person, and especially if you're a rose person, because it works for almost any garden, which is fantastic. So let's get into those questions. Let's get it down into it. Is the rose scented? 
yes it doesn't have a crazy crazy scent to it it's lightly scented i would say it's a little bit i'm on like the sweet fruity side instead of like the heady kind of rose side uh where some roses have that like really heavy rosy like rose perfume kind of smell um this one is a little lighter a little sweeter a little bit on that fruity kind of note it's not a crazy scented rose um it is what we call um a floribunda meaning that you have multiple flowers and you can see on this look this one stem three roses right the big one in the middle and the little ones here so instead of those tall tea roses that tend to be the more smelly kind of one not always there's exceptions uh the huntington 100 is uh, a grand or flora bundle like this and that one does smell really really well uh but this one is a little bit on the lighter side but it's got a it's got a nice smell but you got to kind of get into it what is the retail price that's a good question what is the retail price the retail price is 69.99 yeah, apricot, floribunda, orange, pink, and uh, orange, pink, and apricot. And they say slightly spicy, but I don't really find that it's a spicy smell. I find that it's more of a little bit of a like fruity kind of smell to it. How often do you water it when it's in a pot? So in pots, you have to be a little bit careful. All roses like and appreciate a really deep, low watering, but they want to dry out in between. Roses cannot be soggy. They don't want wet feet. Uh, so you got to be really careful about that. If you're going to do one in a pot, do not put a saucer underneath it. It does not want to sit in its own water because it will soak that water back up inside and then it never fully uh, dries out. So putting your pot on pot feet to raise it up off the ground will definitely help. Uh, my, my little thing about saucers and pots is a lot of people are like, oh, but I need to save my travertine or whatever I have. If you've ever moved a saucer from underneath a pot, there's going to be a big ring because that creates a lot of condensation underneath there so popping them up on pot feet really is what's going to save uh, whatever it's underneath uh, so popping that up definitely helps um, in the ground um, I would say these need a deep watering like once a week if it's on the cooler side to twice a week depending on how inland you are anywhere from two to three times a week when we get into the really hot summers uh, so you want to make sure that they're watered deep and slow. Same thing with a container. So with a container, you want to water deep and low. You want to make sure that the water's coming out the bottom. No little cup of water here and there. They need good drainage all the way down to the bottom. Um, and then you're going to water a little bit more, especially if you're going to have it on concrete, up against a wall, uh, in a pot. It's going to stay a lot warmer, right? And that's usually the formula of where a pot's going to go. Uh, so you're probably going to want to do it twice a week, especially when you're first getting them established. Uh, it is on the cooler side so um and then once you get into the summertime three times maybe four if it's going to be super hot but again you want to feel the top the top wants to feel dry you don't want the top to feel like super super wet all the time of course right after you watered it will but this rose even has a little bit of moisture in here still and i would say it still doesn't even need to be watered yet if you're planning on keeping them in the peat pots uh, you cannot keep them in these peat pots indefinitely they need to go into a larger container the general rule of thumb is at least double the size. I always tell everybody go as big as you can possibly go because it's less work for you. A smaller pot requires more watering. A bigger pot requires less watering. Uh, and then also too, you don't want to have to down the road have a good root bound and now you got to buy another pot and you've spent a ton of money and now you have the smaller pot you have to figure out what to do with. So always go as big as you can go. Uh, always definitely helps. Um, good, rich, well-draining potting soil. I would even maybe mix a little bit of cactus mix in with my potting soil because they do appreciate good drainage. Uh, I always have cactus mix on hand uh, and I always mix that in with my citrus. I mix it in with a lot of my stuff. It really helps with the drainage uh, so then that way I don't have to worry about overwatering or things staying wet for too long. Uh, so you want to do a little bit more in a container versus in the ground. So at a time when I'm doing once a week you'd probably do twice a week. If I'm doing two times you'd be doing three times. Uh, so and that's really going to be in the hotter summer months where you're going to water more and in the beginning make sure that you're keeping them well watered because they're a little bit sensitive the roots are really small and you're trying to get that water down deep so you're encouraging the roots to go down 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 not out so that's why i want you to let that top dry out so they're not going up they're going down that's always going to make for a healthy way more established plant down the road any other questions are there any 
other roses also good for coastal areas to plant with this rose? Yeah, so there's a lot of things. I, I, I find that generally the floribundas tend to be a little bit more forgiving than the, the tea roses and the hybrid tea roses. Um, I am very, very coastal and I really do find that my plants are so much better because I've been really, really good about how I'm fertilizing them all the time. Um, in the beginning when I first had roses and I've had roses for ages, um, I was using dun, 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 a systemic, which is super bad for your rose. And I didn't really know. And I was using that systemic and thinking that that was the only thing keeping my roses slightly okay. And I was constantly fighting all kinds of problems with it because just like humans, plants need to have a really good diet. The better they're being fed, the better they're being treated, the better they're gonna perform for you. And that systemic kills off all the bad stuff and all the good stuff. So it's gonna kill off the earthworms. It's gonna kill off the beneficial nematodes. It's gonna kill off all the good mycorrhizae, which is a beneficial fungus in the ground. Um, and I didn't really realize that. So um, once I got moved away from that, and it's been about five years, my roses are better than they ever were before. And I used to swear that I could never do roses organically. Uh, and I thought it would just be super hard and it's really not. They're actually so much better. Uh, consistency is the key. So uh, there are a lot of roses. They have really beautiful signs that have all the photos on there. Marissa behind the camera is the one who helped me with a lot of those. Also shout out to Jordan. Um, but we will put on there um, the disease resistance, the smell of the rose, um, how big it gets, a picture of the color. So you get all that great information but I do find that the smaller lower floribundas tend to be more disease resistant I never have problems on my Frida um, I have a distant drums at home as well I didn't have any distant drums um, colors to pick for you none of them were flowering but it fits in well with this coloration too which is really great um, and I don't have a lot of problems my state of grace a little bit more than any of my other ones um, same thing with my lady of shallot and again those are the taller ones so it seems to be and I don't know if it's just the ones I've got but that the shorter ones tend to be a little more disease resistant but there's also all that great information on those tags too so if you're looking for other colors because I know I'm a little biased with these colors uh, it says that on all those as well can you re-explain um, the rose and flower spray? Uh, yeah, so um, this one, again, I, I tend to use my hose and water as my first resort for things, even for powdery mildew. You can spray down powdery mildew and don't worry about it spreading it around. Um, I tell, you know, there's certain people I kind of give out this information all day long and I'll say, oh, if you have aphids, spray them off with a hose. Or if you have powdery mildew, spray it off with a hose and everybody kind of goes, what? <laughs> And they're afraid that they're going to be spraying around and they're going to be landing on other plants and infecting other plants. And that's really not the case because uh, they're so soft body when you spray them off, uh, typically it kills them. And if you're washing them down here in Southern California, we don't have those spring showers. So we don't have the luxury of having the environment kind of do it for us. So occasional spray down is good on the foliage, not all the time. Never overhead water your roses or your tomatoes or anything like that. Nothing really wants to be overhead water watered uh, but that occasional spray down uh, is really helpful for, for the plants and when I do it is when I'm fertilizing um, I even do it if I know that something like I have a couple of citrus that I tend to get a lot of uh, sooty um, mold growing on them and when I fertilize my citrus I spray them really hard with a hose and that really helps it makes a huge huge difference um, if it's something that's getting out of control and that spraying down is not helping um, I use the rose and flower spray so this is three-in-one garden spray um, um, there is multiple ones that say three in one and there's one that says vegetables and there's one that just says three in one and there's one that says rose and flowers the secret they're all the same every single one is the same if you look at the ingredients it's just different packaging which I think is funny but they all come in this green bottle this has sulfur in it which helps with all of the fungal problems and insecticidal soap which happens with uh, helps with all the soft bodied stuff so I will still if I need to spray because I have a lot of aphids or something going on I'll spray it with the hose I'll let it completely dry and then I'll spray it with this the nice thing about this totally organic you don't have to worry about anything else on here it's very
very, very mild. Um, it will dry, uh, then it's not uh, an issue for the bugs anymore. So when you are spraying, you wanna spray to the point of just a bit of a runoff and a little bit of saturation because you wanna get everything down in there. If you have a really big outbreak, you wanna use this every seven to 10 days for at least three rounds because you wanna make sure uh, that you're killing off everything because the first time you're not gonna kill everything. You're gonna leave a couple and what are they gonna do? They're gonna breed and make more. So you have to keep spraying until you end that cycle. Uh, but it's pretty easy to control as long as you don't let it get crazy out of hand. And if you are letting it get crazy out of hand, I'm gonna guess that your rose is unhappy with the way that you're feeding it. So um, often, oops, sorry. Often when I have people who say like they have so many problems, I ask them, how are you watering? How are you feeding? And usually I find uh, that there's some kind of hitch in there that's making their rose way worse. They're either overwatering it. Typically people are overwatering. Uh, they're feeding it systemics. They're feeding it that blue crystal fertilizer, which I won't name by name. Um, and that rose eventually just gets weakened by that. And they're not as strong as they are when you're feeding them good, healthy food that they need, where they're actually getting stronger and building up a natural immune system just like people. Isn't it amazing? So the more junk we eat, uh, taking antibiotics, taking steroids, all those kind of things, eventually weak, weakens us and kills off all the good things in the long run. Any other questions for us? Yes, the orange powder that develops on roses, does that spray help? Yes, that's rust. So, and that's usually gonna be on the bottom side of your leaf. Um, and we get powdery mildew and we get rust because of the environment. It is, we are very humid here. Uh, so that humidity is always a factor, but also, Think about how you're watering because you can cut down the humidity about um, and the way that you're watering. I do not use spray uh, pop-up irrigations near my rose because that is creating naturally a ton of humidity um, when they're going because you're getting a lot of evaporation and making that whole air, like microclimate very, very humid. I never ever get my roses wet when I'm watering them, only when I'm spraying them down as treatment. Um, I always water them at a base with a hose. You can use like a dripper, you can use, uh, you know, even a perforated, uh, like hose where you actually attach that to the end of your hose. It's like a soaker hose. Uh, when I am in the deep, deep, deep part of summer, sometimes I'll use that because it's a lot to water um, for me. So uh, making sure you're not getting it on the foliage and that you're cutting that water down. I just, every time I have someone come in and they say, oh, I water every single day for four minutes, I die a little inside, <laughs> quite honestly. It's just so bad for your plants. Don't water them like that. They want to be dried out in between and they want that deep, deep water uh, and they don't wanna stay soggy on the top. Nothing wants to stay soggy on the top. So just think about like our feet, right? You don't want your shoes wet all the time. How horrible is that? So think about the same thing with your roses. What is the brand that makes the three in one? Oh, it's Safer Brand. Um, so it comes in this like crazy green bottle. Uh, Safer Brand does a lot of really great things. I use them for a lot of, I love Safer, I love Monterey. Uh, both of those are really great companies. Uh, they make really amazing things. Um, you wanna shake this really well. We sell this as a concentrate. Um, I use the concentrate because I do have a lot of plants um, and I put it in my pump sprayer and I love that pump sprayer because you can get up underneath things because it's pressurized. Uh, if you have a lot of plants, this is kind of hard. After a while, your hand gets tired from spraying, right? So uh, I love my pump sprayer, um, but I do keep one of these ready to go because I don't always need to mix up a ton to go in my pump sprayer. So I have both. I have uh, my concentrate and I have this. So if I'm just spot treating a couple of little things just very quickly before work, just spray, spray, spray. Usually you're gonna find uh, the aphids and stuff on the, on the new growth. And if you get that yellow, or sorry, that orange powdery little spot, it's gonna be on the underside of the leaves. That's when you know you have rust. Uh, so make sure you're spraying, make sure that you're treating them well, you're feeding them well, and that you're watering correctly. That's huge. Can you use the rose and flower spray on milkweed for aphids? Okay, so milkweed for aphids. You don't want and, to spray. Hold on. And does it harm the eggs? Sorry. Okay, there we go. Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> um, so uh, the native milkweed, the narrow leaf milkweed that you see here, gets oleander aphids like mad. And it's so frustrating because it's so unattractive. I do find, because I plant my milkweed around my roses, it doesn't spread. So that was something I got really nervous about at first, um, was it, it having it spread. Um, the oleander aphids are those orange aphids. Um, I will spray them with a hose very, very lightly, but I'm always checking to see if there's any eggs. It's really, really hard to see uh, a monarch egg. They are tiny. They're smaller than the aphids are. They're little itty bitty. If I notice that I have uh, butterflies kind of hanging around, I just don't do it. I will sometimes wipe it off. Um, I'm 
crazy enough that I have a toothbrush and a tiny little paintbrush in my shed. So if I see that it's coming on, I'll kind of dust them off with that. Um, I don't ever spray them with anything other than water. You could, but if there are eggs on there, that could definitely be an issue. Um, the way insecticidal soap works um, is that it gets onto the exoskeleton, onto the eggs, um, onto anything that's there, and it actually kind of starts um, they start to kind of disintegrate. They actually kind of, it breaks them down and makes them so uh, they start to dissolve basically. Um, so you do not want to get that on the egg. So with that, you know, with great power comes great responsibility, right? I find that um, I just leave it. Sometimes I'll wipe it off, sometimes I'll brush it off, but I'm really paying attention to what's going on. Once it gets late in the season and I know that the butterflies are super active, I just deal with it, but it doesn't spread. I have not had it spread onto any of my other plants. I'm not saying that it can't, but I've been doing this for long enough that I've never had that problem. So uh, I feel pretty fortunate and feel pretty confident in saying that I have not had it spread to my other plants. Um, and the oleander is aphids very, very different. It's that very orange color, whereas the aphids that I get on my roses are the green color. So um, yeah, I just, by the end of the season, I just kind of leave them. By the beginning of the season, I try to control it a little bit. Um, my milkweed does get some of the worm castings because I have a worm farm at home. Um, and I do find that the ones that are closer to my rose, because I use my worm castings on it a lot, have a lot less of that problem. So you can use that in there as well. And that will not affect the butterflies or the eggs at all. Last question, can you show us the rose and flower mix? Oh yeah, yeah, that's this guy here. So this is down to earth. This is the rose and flower mix. Um, I use this sucker on everything. I buy the big, big bags uh, and I put them in uh, large containers in my shed. Um, my strawberries love it. Um, I will sometimes even switch up some of my vegetables to this because it's this high number here. So this is gonna encourage a lot of flower growth. Um, so all my annual plants I use this on, um, but this is a really great one. So I use this kind of interchangeably sometimes with my other stuff. So like with my all purpose, um, even with some of my things uh, like my blueberries and stuff to encourage the extra flush of growth. So on my roses, I'm pretty exclusive about just using this one and the compost tea. Um, the compost tea is not a substitute for fertilizing. It's an addition to fertilizing, right? So this is the food you eat to stay alive and this is the vitamins we take to make ourselves healthier and make us absorb that food a little bit more. Um, so don't just use this. You gotta have this one and then addition to this one and this really, really makes um, your plants take up the nutrients a whole lot better uh, when you use that. But I absolutely love this. Again, a fourth of a cup to a half of a cup per rose, depending on the size of your rose. So my rose trees, I use half a cup um, and monthly. I always do it monthly on there so that way I don't forget. I always do it at the first of the month so I remember <laughs> to do it and I don't think, when did I fertilize last? So um, that's a really, really great one. Um, I've been using this one for about five years now and I love it. All right, last question. Yeah. Are there some plants that you should not use that fertilizer for? Not really. I mean, I wouldn't, here's the thing. Organics smell bad. So I'm just gonna warn you on that. It does have kind of a funny smell after you fertilize. So if I'm going to have a party, if I'm gonna have company, I make sure that I'm fertilizing uh, at least five days before that happens or after everybody has come over because uh, there is bone meal and blood meal and kelp meal and all these things in there. It's a little stinky. It has like almost like a little kind of a cabbagey smell almost to it. Um, so it will smell, but it won't smell for long, about two days or so. Um, you can really kind of use this on anything, but things where you're trying to encourage just straight green growth, um, this is not gonna be super great because the green growth is gonna be your nitrogen number. So this is MPK, um, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. The middle one is for flowers. The first one is for green growth. The second one is like general health of the plant. Uh, the vigorousness of it, how it can fight things off and stuff like that. So um, anything that's flowering, this is gonna be great on. If you, like, for example, like maples, I wouldn't use this on my maple. I use the all purpose, even though the number is a little bit higher there on that, uh, has a higher nitrogen um, on there. I use a little bit of my acid mix too, my for that I use on my blueberries. Um, I'll use that on my maples as well. But things like that, you wanna use something that has more nitrogen because you're not trying to encourage flowers because it doesn't have flowers that you're really looking for right? So you're just kind of, there are a lot of times people are like, I need fertilizer. I'm like, okay, but what are you fertilizing? Because that makes a difference, right? Everything has a little bit of a different requirement. Um, but I use this one on a lot of things. Anything I have at home that flowers, I put it on there basically. 
cool. All right, so we are done with the questions. If there's any more questions, put them down below. If you came in late to uh, put your questions down below, we'll answer those. Make sure you tag all your Disney fans and make sure that they're down in there so they know that we have the Disney rose because we will sell out of these. And it's always a bummer towards the end of the season when someone's like, oh, I wanted to buy a Disney rose for somebody for Christmas. And I'm like, sorry, we don't have them anymore. Um, so uh, it's really kind of an amazing thing that we have these. It's super exciting. We got them last year too. They sold out like that. We didn't get as many. We do have a good supply right now. Um, so you can always call us too and uh, buy it over the phone and we can hold it for 10 days. So if you're like, oh, I gotta get that, uh, you can always buy it and we'll hold it for you for 10 days uh, here at Rogers and you can come pick it up. Um, but yeah, it's a beautiful rose, super easy, great beginner rose. If you are not uh, a big rose gardener, um, a great rose to have in your collection, especially for people who collect all the ones that have specific people's names or places. It's a great one for that. Really good one to mix in with all the different colors because it really does match in with a lot of different things. So thank you so much for tuning in. I love doing these with you. Uh, make sure you sign up for our email list because because you will not know when we get the Disneyland roses in unless you're watching these and I'm telling you, but we will always tell you all the great stuff that's coming in. If you wanna know when we're getting milkweed, go to the website, sign up for the email. We will let you know when that stuff comes in. So you'll be the first one to know about all of that. Uh, check out our YouTube page too, because there's a ton of great information there, tons of beautiful videos. Um, they go on and on and on about all different sorts of things. So if you got a question, I swear we have a video about it. So make sure you check that out as well and subscribe to that. So thank you so much. I really appreciate all of you. Uh, come and grab your Disney Rose and be well and be safe and happy gardening, everybody. Bye.